Hello everyone. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the basics of VOR navigation. Now, previously we took a look at ADF slash NDV, which was a pretty straightforward method of navigating. Basically, all you had to worry about there is uh, making sure you're on the right frequency and pointing the plane so that the needle is centered. VOR navigation is a little bit more complicated, although you can really use the two of them pretty much together. So in this case, we've gone back to this website. This is Luis Montiero. Uh, he does a really, really good job. If you go on Google and literally type in ADF or a VOR simulator, he does a really nice job of kind of getting you ready for these kind of things. Again, I'm not getting paid for this. It's just something that works really, really well to help explain it. So let's go ahead and take a look at our situation. So we have our airplane again, and we have a VOR station. VOR stations are designated by having this weird kind of a hexagon kind of thing going here. Um, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, ah, pet seven, you know what I mean. And around that, of course, is you have a square, saying that it's not just a VOR, but it's also a DME. So we can actually change what mode it is. We can come up here and make it just a VOR. We can set it to be a Vortac, which is basically a military version. You can even come over here and make it things like localizers and glide slopes and LDAs and SDFs and everything like that. That is all something for a very other day. For now, I'm going to leave it as a VOR and DB. So what we have to do is we have to predict which one of the courses we want to fly to get to the NDB station. If I were to just take my little airplane, now this is the actual HSI. Uh, actually, not an HSI, I'm sorry, this is a CDI, it's course deviation indicator. If I just took the plane and went like this, na -na 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 -na, and flew over the top, you get one of those. So what you're probably wondering is, what's the deal with that needle in the middle? And what's the deal with this little flag that says to and fra? Well, that simply tells you, are you facing the station? And this tells you how close you are to going to that station on a specific course. So right now, this course has been selected to be at 30 degrees. That means, if you want to imagine an imaginary line going through the center of this, you're actually going through this, trying to hit exactly 30 degrees. Now what this needle here does, is this tells us how close to being on that 30 degree line we need to be at. So if I were to actually grab the aircraft and move it this way, there we are. Notice we're now perfectly centered. Our little course line, our lubber line, or I like to call it the noodle, is now perfectly centered, even though the aircraft is not pointing where we need to go. Now, if we were to continue going along this line, notice that we now approach that place at a very specific point, in this case, 30 degrees, even though we never actually faced 30 degrees. Now, if we were in a no-win situation, surprise, surprise, theoretically, all we'd have to do is center that needle and then give ourselves a heading of whatever the heading we need to follow for the course. In this case, 30 degrees and 30 degrees. If we were to just go ahead and I'll go ahead and speed up time real quickly to make things a little bit easier for us. Let's do 10 times. Let's go up here and go ahead and play it. Look, you can see that we're on course, on this course, going towards the station. And by coincidence, since there's no wind, we don't have to worry about any other detail. Now, one of the nice things that we can get to is what they call DME. That's distance measuring equipment. Down here, this VOR station not only tells us where we need to be, it tells us how far away we are, how fast we're going, and how long it's going to take to get there. Now, if you recall from the NDB, when you cross one of those stations, the needle does some pretty silly things. Well, there's actually something else that's going to happen. Our distance is going to suddenly go down, stop, and then start going back up. And this little flag right here is going to suddenly flip itself around. Watch this. Boing, there it goes. And now we're going from the station on the same course. You can immediately see how valuable this is. So let's go ahead and create a scenario here. Let's say we're coming roughly, I want to say, east. Let's say we want to land an airplane on runway tree sick. Or, yeah, we'll do tree six, which is basically zero. What we need to do is without knowing where the line is that we need to follow, we need to figure out how to get to it. So let's go ahead and grab the plane and pretend we're still heading due east. Now watch what happens. The needle will start shifting towards the center. And then what we would need to do is actually start turning the plane so that after we intercept that course, we can actually start to follow the course directly all the way up to it, just like that. Now, do we need to be going exactly east to get to this course the fastest possible? Yes. But in the real world, we actually don't usually need to be that precise unless you're dealing with mountains or something like that. What we do instead is we go right in between these two angles, which in this case would be about a 45 degree angle. So if I bring ourselves on a heading of right in the middle, which is about right there, it looks pretty good. And I were to go ahead and proceed along this course, 
Watch what happens when we cross it. Now we don't have to turn the plane nearly as far in order to stay on that line and then go ahead and go straight across it. Now the reason this is so powerful is if we were doing something like landing on a runway that is this heading. Now all we have to do is keep this line centered and we can safely land it. Now let's go ahead and introduce some wind, which of course as everybody knows is our arch enemy here. We'll say uh, 50 knots at 270. Please don't be in winds that strong at low altitude, you shouldn't be flying that day. So now let's go ahead and play our simulation. As you remember from doing NDB stuff, you would see that the needle would start to shift this way. In this case, the course starts to shift this way. So we would just have to go ahead and figure out exactly what we need to do to keep that needle perfectly centered. So in this case, I'll just let it go. Looks like we can come to the right a teeny tiny bit. Let's come to the right a teeny tiny bit. Okay, the needle's coming back to the center, so I'm going to shift to the left a little, and a little bit more to the right. And you can see how much easier it is to figure out that magic angle just by watching the motion of that line. Let's go ahead and come back to the center, and now we're perfect. And that's really all there is to it. There's actually variations on this theme. And like I was saying with the NDB, you can actually go one step further and go ahead and use it to triangulate your position. But as long as you know how far away you are and what angle you are, you can find your position anywhere near this particular situation. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example here. So what I've done is I've taken, uh, decided to bring us over to Syria, stick to the DCS theme here. But we're going to have Cyprus. Um, coming all the way up to here, um, you can see Rev. Rene Mouad, this is uh, Oscar Lima Kilo Alpha. We're going to be taken off from here, proceeding along the coast. We're going to go to Cheka VOR, which is a frequency of 116.2. It is going to be channel 109er, and this is our Morse code to identify it. Coming along here, we're going to grab a new VOR, and this one is going to be down here. This is going to be CALD. This is 112.6 kilo, kilo Alpha Delta, channel 73 if we were doing military. Notice the presence of some NDBs as well, so we can use multiple ways to get us to our destination. All right, let's go ahead and pop over to the simulator and see what we need to do to get this all rolling. All right, I'm looking pretty good, looking pretty good. Again, we'll be flying in the Bonanza today to make my life a little bit simpler. It's just easy to fly. All right, let's do it to it. So first things first, we want to make sure we're on the correct frequencies. This aircraft has two VOR radios on board, NAV1 and NAV2. What we want to do is use both of these in order to make our life a little bit simpler. So what I'm going to do for NAV1 is I'm going to dial in the frequency for Cheka, which if you remember is 116.20. And then I'm going to press the swap button, which is going to automatically identify it for us. Isn't that amazing? In the old days, you had to do it by listening. You don't have to do that anymore. You can just look. And then I'm going to press in on this knob to switch to navigation 2. In navigation 2, I'm going to be putting in Cal. That's 112.60. Perfect. Swap. Watch this. Boop. And you can see these have automatically been identified, which is amazing. Man, I would kill for this technology in the plane I used to fly. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my CDI. I'm going to set it to VOR1. Now, which direction do we need to travel to get to that first VOR? Well, this needle says what course we've selected, and this needle tells us how close we are. So, theoretically, all I have to do is go to the course knob, which is right here, and give this thing a wheel until suddenly the thing centers. Now, watch this trick. If you actually just click it, it'll automatically point to the nearest VOR station, which is on a course of 217 degrees. That's all there is to it. Now what we have to do is take off, point in this direction, and just keep this line perfectly centered until we get to the VOR. Then we're going to do a little bit of fancy work. What I'm actually going to do real quickly is in order to save myself a little bit of trouble later, is I'm going to actually flip this to the 112.6 uh, also, just to save me a minute. You'll see why I do that in a little bit. All right, let's go ahead and flip on the pitot heat. I don't need the landing light. It's pretty bright outside today. Obviously, I wouldn't need the pitot heat either, but hey, do what you can, right? All right, let's roll. And off we go. Something to warn you about with VOR anything is you're always going to have limitations as far as line of sight is concerned. If the VOR station finds itself on the opposite side of a big mountain, you're going to find it very difficult to receive a signal for it. In the real world, VOR, by the way, is only accurate within, on a good day, maybe four degrees. Obviously, if you're doing an ILS approach, that is a very different machine than VOR, even though it uses the same basic principle. All right. I'm going to go bring up our flaps of gear. Somebody was asking me the other day, oh, why don't I turn the autopilot on as soon as I get airborne? I just don't need to. Honestly, it, it slows things down sometimes. And the autopilot, at least in this version, remember, this is still September, so the um, flight simulator is not even a month old. There's still some bugs they got to kind of work out. All right, I'm going to go ahead and take my gentle left turn. I'm going to go double check to make sure the aircraft is nice and cleaned up, which it is. 
And now I'm going to point directly at my VOR needle there. Whoop, getting a little high. That's okay. Looks like we got that turbulence back from last time. And I'm going to go ahead and bring my RPM back just a teeny tiny bit. I'm going to go over here and flip on the automatic pilot. And now I'm going to turn on my navigation hold. So what this is going to do is the automatic pilot is going to roll the plane to keep this needle perfectly centered for us. Actually, I'm going to flick the flight director on. It's being a little aggressive about it in the real world. Please don't be turning the plane 45 degrees to intercept the line that's that close. That thing is literally less than a quarter mile off course. So uh, while that's kind of go ahead and get itself established, I'm going to come down here and play with some of these tools now. So one of the nice things about the G1000 is you can actually display information about the VOR as far as distances and stuff like that goes just by clicking the PFD and then selecting DMA, which will give you the distance to the whatever navigation radio you have selected. Or if you prefer, you can actually bring up the bearing mode and it will provide you these little blue lines to point exactly where the VOR station is as well as how far they are. Note, this is not the same thing as DME. DME is slant distance. So I'm actually going to switch bearing two, and it can actually point all the way to where we're going up in Bree Route, even though we literally just took off from way, way up north. So um, of course, like we did before, I'm going to go ahead and bring my wind display up, just so we know which direction we're going to be landing in. Looks pretty good. I'm going to shut this off because nobody needs it. And I'm going to flip over here, and I'm going to shut this off too. By the way, uh, one thing that I will point out while I'm here, you know, why not, right? Is you can actually change the channel spacing to make this less touchy. If you push in on this, you can actually just come up here and crank this over to a different frequency, 25. And now your channel spacing is a lot further apart, which makes your life a lot simpler with certain types of tuning. But again, do what makes sense for you if you're ever wondering what that page is for. And of course, there's other pages too. I may not have mentioned my G1000 tutorial. You've got you know, your navigation pages. You've got your nearest intersection pages and everything along those lines. But I'm leaving it blank today because again, this is a demonstration on radio navigation. It's not a demonstration on you know, how to use the G1000's GPS features. All right, I'm going to continue to climb all the way up to 3,500 feet. Ah, another absolutely beautiful country. It's just, it's, it's amazing. I imagine the weather here gets really nice certain times of year because it's gent perfectly right on the Mediterranean. Uh, Cyprus is over that way somewhere. Just awesome. All right, I'm going to get ready to level off, and then we'll go ahead and start setting our plane up for our cruise. Relatively short flight today, by the way. I know you're looking over there and saying, I don't know, this says that it's a 30-minute flight. It won't be when I get to it. And altitude hold load. Let the aircraft level off completely, accelerate, then start reaching for the power controls. All right, start picking up some speed. The whole aircraft starts to level off on its own. It's kind of a weird sensation in the real plane. Oh man, this is great. Absolutely great. It's really neat to be able to see this versus the DCS version. Both of them are really, really solid. All right, you can see our speed's coming up very, very quickly. Our cruise speed's going to be about 171, I believe. This is a modified version of the Bonanza as far as Flight Simulator is concerned. This isn't the default one. This one, somebody made a great release on the Microsoft forums that kind of cleans these things up. Definitely worth checking out. I think I have a comment of that up on my community page somewhere. All right, time to start getting us ready for cruise. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first start by reducing power. Always use the hand the closest to before you use the hand further away. Now we're going to start reducing RPM. We're looking for 25 inches of mercury and 2,500 RPM. Like I've complained about a million times, you've got to be really gentle with this step. In the real plane, it is so easy to move this slider. You just go, oh, like that, and you're good to go. Hey, that never happens. Now we're going to go ahead and use the auto leaning feature to go ahead and lean out our mixture a little bit. And now we are cruising. It says we have a 17 minute cruise time, but it's not actually going to take 17 minutes. Watch this. Ha ha ha! Yeah, I finally had to add a button on my joystick for this purposes, just to save you guys a little bit of time. Again, we're looking for the concept. We're not looking for, you know, doing anything crazy here. Save those for live streams. All right, we're 10.7 nautical miles away. Now, when you get to a VOR station, there's a critical thing you have to do right, otherwise you may encounter some difficulties. Oh man, I think an F-16 can do this speed, but I don't think a Bonanza can. Yeah, we're doing about 172. My math's actually pretty good today. All right, when we get to about three, one, two, three. Let's make sure I didn't slow it down too much. I've done that. Oh, look at how beautiful that is. That's so cool. Anyway, let me double check to make sure I didn't overfreeze. Okay, so when we get to the VOR station, we're going to have to flip to the next VOR station. To do that, I highly recommend doing heading hold. Start by synchronizing. Activate heading hold mode so that you hold this direction. 
then switch frequencies. Now there's two ways we could do this. The first method we could do is we could swap to CAD and then we could act, change our course or we can actually come down here to where it says CDI, click that once, and since we already selected CAD, we can now actually go in here and just dial what we want. I'm actually going to cheat a little here. I'm going to go ahead and center it automatically. Isn't that so convenient? All right. We're going to go actually swap this. Remember, we're on VOR2 right now, so we're drawing from navigation to radar, in which case, like I said, it's CAD. Uh, Computer-aided drafting, no. So what I'm waiting for here is to actually cross the NDB station, or they should say the VOR station. We know we're going to cross it because, surprise, surprise, that VOR station is literally in the middle of that airport down there. We can actually stick our heads out the window. I don't know if we can see it. Ah, no, I guess we can't see it today. This is so cool. Uh, oh, apparently there's a lot more turbulence in Lebanon. <laughs> something ironic about that, but I can't put my finger on it. All right, we're just about to cross. Watch what happens. See how the distance started going back up again? That means you've crossed it. So now I'm going to go ahead and recenter this. I'm going to turn the navigation hold mode back on. The aircraft is going to take ourselves a left-hand turn, and it's time to start thinking about landing in Beirut already. <laughs> it's so cool. I can just imagine, like, too bad you don't get, like, real snow here, so you can be like, sledding hill. No, just kidding. I miss sledding. Okay, so now we need to start planning our descent. So first things first, uh, flying into Beirut here, there's a lot of different runways that we can choose from. There's basically, and they're all crazy and at all sorts of different angles parallel to each other. You have to be really, really cautious. The other issue we have is we're still at 3,500 feet, but we're 29 nautical miles away from our destination. So how can we figure out when we need to start descending? This is another common question I get. Believe it or not, this tool, since I've locked everything into the FMS, tells me how many minutes it's gonna to take to get there. Now it's simply a matter of taking my altitude, dividing by 500, and that's how many minutes it's going to take us to descend at 500 feet per minute. So in this case, 35 divided by 500 is gonna give us seven. So we need to start descending at seven minutes out. However, remember we're going to a traffic pattern altitude of about 1,000 feet, so we don't actually need to go down that aggressively. We can wait until six minutes away. Now, if you had an old school DMA slash VOR, it would actually give you a timer on it, and it can tell you exactly how far it's gonna take. Unfortunately, you know, in this new fancy pants thing, I don't have a time on here, which is such a bummer, because it's so much nicer when you can do it that way. All right, I am on my way. So once it hits about six minutes, we'll start our descent. One, two, three, whee! It is, oh man, man, I'm getting such a tailwind today. What is up with this? Probably should have cranked the clouds up to make this a little bit scarier, but hey, I'll take what I can get. Again, we're not using any magical menus or anything like that here. This is all using just the radio navigation. All right, that's close enough. All right, double check to make sure my time acceleration is good. It is. Let's start our descent. So first things first, I'm gonna go ahead and dial my altitude. Cruise, our pattern altitude is about 1,000 feet. It's like 1,040 feet, but that's more than close enough. I'm gonna flip on vertical speed mode. But wait, I'm not gonna flip on vertical speed mode. You're probably going, okay, so why? Well, because I'm gonna shut the automatic pilot off and I'm gonna push the nose down and reduce my power to about 21 inches. And I'll do it right there, perfect. Now, the reason I'm doing this manually is I find it is much, much, much smoother to have a nice gentle human touch than to kind of just work it with the autopilot. It's gonna get a little too jumpy on me. All right, now that I've got it kind of the way I want it, I'm gonna just flip the autopilot back on real quick. Whoop, hit that one more time. There we go. Hey. Of course, what did it do? It just leveled me back up at 3,000 feet. Bad autopilot. <laughs> Don't have this problem in the real world. There we go. Perfect. All right. I'm just going to come down on my own. You can always use your feet, too, if you have rudder pedals to kind of synchronize this just a little bit. Oops, started picking up a bit too much power. Now I'll go ahead and set this manually. Vertical speed, down, 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 500 feet per minute. Looks pretty good to me. Start swinging the other way. All right, let's try the autopilot this time. All right, there we go. Perfect. Nice. Okay. Again, sometimes human intervention goes a long way here. All right, here is our airport straight ahead. Again, we're using the VOR at. Oh, clouds. 
We're using the VOR at that airport in order to guide us down onto the ground. We're not using the one from before. Now, is there anything stopping us from using the one we just left just a moment ago? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, we could do that easily. We could also, you know, at any point switch over to our GPS as well if we wanted to kind of do an approach, anything along those lines. So let's start thinking about our approach here. So take a look real quickly. I can see that the wind is basically coming from this direction. So looking at the runways we have available for us, we have one extremely dangerous approach where we could try to come in this way and land that way. Or we could have a little bit safer approach where basically we come out here and come in this way. I'm guessing that's going to be backwards to where we need to be. So I'm actually going to go with that runway right here. Again, it totally depends. Now one of the cool things we can do, is we can actually come over here. You could actually go to airport mode and you could actually select that airport and just dial in the details directly in order to double check to make sure that you have that all set up and ready to go. So in this case, I could actually come in here and type in my airport, which is uh, OLBA, Oscar Lima Bravo Alpha. So I'd come in here like this. Take K-L-M-N-O. Now the real one of these, you can actually put visual approaches in, which I think is really cool. OLBA, there it is, whoop, enter, enter. Ta-da! Now you can even see what your different runways are going to have to be for when you do your approach here. And again, you can kind of work it out really, really quickly based on the wind direction, which like I said, is again coming like this. So we could do something like that, but it's gonna be a heck of a crosswind. But hey, it's better than nothing, right? All right, let's bring us in. All right, we're coming about 2,000 feet. We're coming right up on the city of Beirut, big city. Wonderful port city. And it is so neat to compare this to the DCS version. Nice. All right, let's start thinking about landing. I'm going to switch over to our fullest fuel tank. Nope, just shut the engine off. Don't do that, please. All right, fullest fuel tank. You don't have that problem in the real world because you can feel it. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and enrich in our mixture again. Looks good. Flip on our landing light. Everything's all set in that regard. We're going to go double check on my cow flaps. I'm going to put them about 50%. Looks good. And everything is looking awesome. I'm actually going to disengage the automatic pilot, and we're going to take a nice gentle turn to the left here. And we are looking really good today. This weather is much nicer than it was the other time we tried this. All right, looking pretty good. We're going to do a straight in approach today as opposed to any sort of instrument approach. We just don't need to. Hey, look at how accurate we were following that line even though we weren't using the GPS. That always makes you feel better. Let's come to my left just a tiny bit here. Stick my head up. Yeah, we're making pretty good speed. Getting a little low, but nothing too, too bad. All right, looking pretty good. All right, that's going to be a heck of a crosswind that we're going to be landing into, but it's much safer than trying to land into the side of a mountain. So I'll take what I can get. All right, start reducing power. Let's do our checklist. Gas, undercarriage, mixture, propeller, flaps, lights, speed. All right, we're quite high here. <laughs> this is so wild. This must be one of the main drags I'm looking at right there. Nice. Swing to my right just a teeny tiny bit. Going to be a bit of a crosswind coming from the right, so we need to actually compensate by moving ourselves slightly to the right. Pretty good, right about there. Our landing speed today is going to be right around 75 knots. All right, looking pretty good, looking pretty good. Whatever you do, don't confuse the taxiway with the runway. It's going a little bit here. <laughs> I'm just so not used to runways that are this big. So just to quickly review VOR, uh, make sure you are on the correct frequency. Remember that you select the course which you want to approach or go away from the VOR. And when you're using aircraft like this, which are VOR based, you can always set it so that it can display on your PFD so you know exactly what VOR you're connected to, as well as how physically far away you are from that VOR. That makes it very, very effective. If you want to try to triangulate two positions using a VOR, you certainly can do that as well. It's just a little bit more difficult in this aircraft. The best method to do that if you do do it is by using the little blue lines that you can see that I enabled earlier during our flight. All right, let's go ahead and put this thing gently on the ground and we'll call it a day. A little high. You know, I've experienced turbulence in the air, but usually it's not quite this bad. 
copy him up. Going very fast here. Whoa! Ah, just like the old days. Alright. Nose up just a little bit. It's going to be a little bumpy. Nice. And we're down. Awesome. So hopefully this sets you up well as far as explaining what approaches are and how to fly those. It's definitely going to be an interesting experience now that you have a little bit of background on how to fly VORs. Really, it's not as scary as it seems. In the real world, usually VOR is your backup as opposed to your primary. But at the same point, is it offers a pretty good challenge, especially to veteran pilots. Enjoy.